Okay. So, who either knows or remembers uh, what economics is? Jeez. Economics is a way of analyzing all hours of the day. Strength, I guess you could say, of the wealth of the country. No, actually, see, now it's, it's far more broad than that. That's that's actually a very common misconception of what economics is. Um, economics is, first of all, it is one of the social sciences. So it is not like, well, it's not like a physical science. Physical science, uh, physical sciences are are lacking one thing that social sciences have, and vice versa. Physical sciences don't deal with human behavior, and social sciences do. So physical science, you can deal with constants in nature and things like that, and, and uh, it's very easy to repeat, replicate experiments. Social science is not so much. You just kind of have to, you have to attempt to isolate base assumptions, things like that. So social sciences tend to not be exact, but there are a number of things in social sciences that have been shown to be quite precise when you take large numbers of people and you start looking at aggregate behavior of people in certain environments, I mean, there are definitely trends and the dials, as they say, can be moved on those things. Which explains why all our countries have very drastically different spreads of wealth and equality. For example, that means people have different dials at different levels. Hi. And of course, each time this guy moves his dial, it What'd you say? adjusts Sorry. everyone else. Oh, we're having an economics teaching. We're learning about economics for free. You can join if you well, want. I'm occupying the steps. Okay. So, I think we should get better at seating if we want the public to join in. So, that's all right. Anyway, okay, so economics is the study of how people allocate their limited resources in an attempt to satisfy their unlimited wants. As such, economics is the study of how people make choices. So it's very, very, I mean, it's a very basic... Wow. It's, yeah, it, it is, a, it is, it's very mechanical, interestingly enough, and I think that's largely because we're all basically, you know, so we're basically apes and we apes. do a lot of ape things and <laughs> we're animals well, well my friend well what my friend calls your monkey like how much of your you know because you do have to keep your monkey happy because if your monkey is not happy you will not be happy no matter what else about your life is happy like if your monkey's not happy you are not happy so you know so that's almost like you can't you can apply these types of principles to situations now it's not so you know, some that, some that of them really didn't have any. Sorry, didn't wrote. have anything to do with money. Yeah, it didn't have anything. It doesn't. To, it doesn't. <laughs> See, money is a conceptual mm. thing, and we can get okay. into that because okay. we've already done that. We've done the definition of money, but I will go over it. But I wanted to do it in the actual order of the this uh, this particular lesson. Okay, so now everybody's aware of what limited resources are, right? Now the thing is. There will always be a limit to resources, and here is why. Regardless of, say, nanotechnological manufacturing that we can, say, produce material goods for pennies a pound, and if we, say, abolished copyright beyond six months or something like that and just let people share stuff and just, or just establish universal grants that we all kind of voted on towards good ideas and, you know put resources towards the best ideas and just made them free for everyone, which is right. a totally viable model. Um, we have one thing that's definitely limited, and that is time. You have a limited amount of time in your day. Even if they even if they could extend your life indefinitely, you still have limited time today. You have a limited time for the next hour. You have limited time for the next minute. And uh, one of my professors, and he, he cracks me up, he always says, why are you here? <laughs> There's only one correct answer to that question, and it is because I have nothing better to do. <laughs> and now there's an economic, there's an economic, 
principle that has to do with that. And it's, it's, it has to do with what's called the rational actor and rational self-interest. We're going to get into that in just a minute, but let me uh, do a couple of definitions. Um, I'm going to explain what a resource is and what a, uh, what a want is. I don't know where to turn this off. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and why do they say this? The sun. The yeah, sun here, on. go ahead. Somebody, they want to Isn't the sun on do that off resource? camera. Hello, Sean. Oh, it's not. I have to say swipe so. it. Swipe it. What about the sun? Is the sun an unlimited resource? I mean, we're not talking about that? the sun. Isn't the sun an unlimited resource? Like no. solar? No, because you can't. That's you so. can't get an unlimited amount of solar energy yeah, in a minute we, or a day or a week. It is a limited. Yeah, it's limited how much. I, I mean, there is a limited. There is a, at even at 99.999 percent efficiency, which you know is not really even foreseeable. Um, the collection rate of solar energy. There is a limit to the amount of you know amount of radiation that hits the Earth. Even if you could extract all of it and make the place a like a cold blasted like <laughs> lifeless planet and absorb all of it there's still a limit to that amount so you know limits can be not very limiting in the practical sense and that's where we get into technological innovations and stuff which is another one of my favorite subjects so um, because the effects that's having on economics is, is pretty is pretty profound so resources are things that have value and more specifically are used to produce things that satisfy people's wants so, meaning resources are things that are valuable, that are used to produce things. Now, wants are all of the things that people would purchase if they had unlimited income. In other words, you could have anything you wanted. Your wants are... Oh, my robot phone thing. I don't know. I don't know what that means. That's... It's, uh, it's like a Transformers... The but, I mean, I don't text know message it's right. indicator. Yeah, it. <laughs> it's horrible. I'm sorry. That's fine. Okay. As long as it can do that in my pocket, then it's okay. Okay. So, whenever an individual or a business or a nation faces alternatives, a choice must be made, and economics is, is the study of how those choices are made by people or entities. And there, there are things like game theory, which examine rational actors in, in positions with other rational actor, actors and they're set up as a game essentially and everybody's object is to do the most rational thing to maximize their position in the game and these things get incredibly complicated to the point where there's like there's PhD level stuff that like when I start to read it I'm just like I don't even want to read the description of this game because it's so multifaceted but there's, there's a guy who uh, just he was on Colbert, The Daily Show, recently, who was talking about a book that he just wrote. And this guy's predicted all these weird social movements and stuff by using game theory yeah. and, like, continuously improving on these big, complicated models yeah. of how people will act. It's like, okay, well, you dial the poverty, you, know, you dial the wealth inequality up to this, yeah. and then that's when, like, a certain amount of this shit starts to occur, and you dial up a little more, and then more of this kind of shit starts to occur. And he's been very successful predicting that sort of thing. Wow. You know, yeah. well, humans are pretty similar all over. I mean, we are basically all the same biological base. Same needs. And, reg and regardless, <laughs> well, yeah, basically the same basic needs. Yeah. I mean, and then you have the manufactured needs that yeah. filter yeah. down to that, but... Uh -huh. Or you yeah. could say mature needs, maybe. Uh, you know, because, yeah. like, aesthetics is a yeah. learned yeah. need, but, yeah. like, I think it's a valuable need to have. Uh -huh. So... Uh -huh. You know, I don't know that empathy is a learned need. I think that's that's pretty inherent because that's that's something that that I mean, most people naturally feel that around a baby, for example. Like if a baby was threatened, most people would be very quick to respond. Like regardless of what kind of person they are, normally that would be a gut reaction that most people would have to try to protect a baby. You know, it's just, and I, I think that's more of an inherent thing. But like I said, aesthetics that's learned and like. You can have different types of aesthetics. Perhaps learn to hold more than one type of aesthetic simultaneously, which is kind of a neat way that our minds work as well. So now, so hey, I got back, I got in the class, so I'm all right. Yay! I was gonna. I've been meeting quite every day. Yeah. I'm very glad. Okay, so 
Now, is everyone familiar with the difference between microeconomics and macroeconomics? One's on a bigger level scale and one's on a smaller scale. Absolutely. It's basically, when you're dealing with individuals or households yeah. and firms, individual firms, that's microeconomics. It's like you're looking at very small parts of the economy, whereas macroeconomics is like the entire economy. And you could study the entire world economy with a macro with macroeconomic models, or a country, or you could even do a state. It just depends on how their governments are done, how effective that will be, and, and which theories you use. Because, like for example, California can't make its own money supply, so we can't, you can't use a model that would include the ability to create, you know, to alter your money money supply. California can't do that. So, like, if you're trying to sell so, a widget, then you'd use microeconomics. Like, if you're the business... Oh, if we're trying to determine, for example, the most... Not um, what to sell, but just how to sell it. You, know, you would study microeconomics. Well, no, how to sell it is more of a marketing. Yeah. Okay. That's the art of making people feel unhappy unless you, <laughs> unless they buy what you have, <laughs> which, is, which yep. is true. That is what marketing yeah, yeah, yeah. is. It's mar that's a very that's cynical way of phrasing word. it, but it's true, and, and it's increasingly true in Black the way that you see. Well, now, um, if you look at our uh, if you look at our consumption rates and our our television watching rates and our like exposure to mark are the rates of our exposure to marketing you do see it a decrease in happiness due to that and when you look at neuroscientists talk about the messaging and the methods of messaging that are used in marketing it is it is designed to make you discontent and want that thing now sometimes now they also have branding ads but that's an attempt to basically beat, beat something into your head through familiarity until you feel it's a positive thing that you want. Yes. So with the law of scale, man, that would be microeconomics, correct? That would be macro. That would be both. Both. It Sorry, it would be both. Well, if there's just, well, you have things like aggregate supply and aggregate demand, and how those balance out. So you could have aggregate supply of corn in the American economy, or the world economy, or the Chinese economy, or California economy. You could, we could be talking about supply and demand of corn in the Sacramento Valley area. Or something like that, or rice, or we could change it, and or we can we can scale that down to supply and demand of a particular model of iPhone in a particular neighborhood, and you can get you and you can make scale these things down as large or as small as you want. That is, uh, well, if you think about this, this has been one of the more intensely studied social sciences for obvious reasons because the knowledge of this will put you at competitive advantage with people who don't understand how this works. Because somebody who's just trying to wing it and use their best judgment is not going to be as successful as somebody who can calculate to a finer degree of precision the behavior of a market, like say with a price change. Like once you start sampling that, it gets very, very accurate. Like you start edging things over a certain price and certain other things happen. Hamburgers get over a certain price, people just start switching to pizza. Like I mean, it really, it works and it's very finely tuned and all these different businesses are tweaking those lines trying to trying to just get that edge and that's why prices are changing regularly in places where it changes where it can change frequently because of that aggressive competition in that in that particular market um we have more guests Hi, Morgan. so now here, here's the uh, here's the thing. Now Adam Smith, does everybody know Adam Smith? You know, great philosopher. He's kind of the like father of modern economics. Is he is he the French invisible hand of the market? Is he French? British. British. I, I would probably have to look that up. If that makes sense. Well, Adam matter. Smith. He's the one. He's what, the supply side. What time period is he? 1776. I think he was British. 
But uh, but he wrote The Nature and Causes of Wealth of Nations, which was basically like, this is how this stuff works. Um, and in, the, in it, he wrote, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interests. So he's talking about basically things based on rational self-interest. And what there's an assumption in economics that in, individuals act as if motivated by self-interest and respond predictably to opportunities for gain. Now, here's the interesting part of that. The rationality assumption is simply stated as follows. We assume that individuals do not intentionally make decisions that would leave them worse off. So, and that is a, turns out to be a really, really safe assumption to make about human behavior. Now, we can incorrectly measure your perception of what makes you worse or better off. So there's certainly, um, you know, there is room for somebody feeling like sacrificing for others or giving, giving to others because that makes you better off in your perception of things. So social capital. Yeah, absolutely. So you can you can you can definitely um, short term gain for long term loss. There's short yeah, there's there's that. Now there's other interesting things. Okay, so what we say is that people because of that the truth of that statement, by definition people respond to incentives. If you create this little you know, this little zone over here where if you go and do this thing you're going to be better off you're going to tend to go do that thing if there's no other better 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 offs at that point or you put this little black mark over here you go over here, oh no that's bad and so you will tend to stay away from that and with those things the monkey is trained <laughs> Basically, I mean, it is. Um, if you get down to it, and so uh, knowing economics can make you question free will. But, uh, it'll, it'll make you. So, um, so essentially, we're looking at a system of studying how different people do different things. And you can even use economic analysis, for example, to like find out the deterrent rate of capital punishment. Because there is a measurable deterrent rate for that. Now, we can also argue on a different plane from that whether or not it's moral or whether or not it's just to have the state with its uh, limited wisdom, I'll say, charitably. Um, you know, and the obvious uh, disparity in treatment between poor people and especially poor black people you know when it comes to capital murder cases and you can get into all these crazy things to go well okay regardless of the deterrent effect we just feel it's not we're, we're just we're in too much of a hazardous situation to trust the trust the state to make these decisions. that was my position incidentally that I was outlining um, because the kind of kind of suppression of defense evidence that I have seen brought to light like where it's like oh yeah you know people are literally saying this will kill our case if this comes out and like they suppress it and this dude's on death row for like 25 years and somebody finally gets a hold of it because somebody slips it to him and they're like wow is this dude just did this whole time and it was not him because it was like some other dude anyway so we're going to go back to uh uh there is a uh, also an, assum an assumption called ceteris paribus, and it means other things constant or other things equal. So what it means is uh, ceteris paribus basically means all other things being equal. If I tell you to like, hey, I'll hire you to dig holes for twelve bucks an hour. Says, hey, I'll hire you to dig holes for 13 bucks an hour. All other things being equal, you're gonna go work for her. Because why would you do the same exact thing? Meaning, all other things, I mean, you're gonna be doing the exact same work, but you're gonna go to the 13 instead of the 12. If 
you got to drive the same distance. You're going to be doing the same work. So that is how they kind of, uh, that is a way of, saying, of being able to isolate a model, like to say, okay, well, we're going to cut all these things out for the purposes of modeling this. And sometimes you can't, you can't take out every X factor. Let's say the person who wants to work doesn't like to work for women. Well, they might rather work for a guy for 12 bucks an hour rather than a woman for 13. Now, I've never met even the most hardcore chauvinist person that would take that deal, but I assume there might be some out there. Maybe one of them, like, you know, cooks dinner or something like that or pays for gas or something like that. Yeah, or, or, or you have that, or you have a boss that's likable. Boss is likable, well then that's, that can, you know, versus a boss that makes you dread coming to work every day. That has value. Uh, so, we've dispelled the notion that this is about money. That's important to note, because we can use these tools to provide the proper kinds of incentives in, in at least our world views. For example, if we incentivize sharing stuff and open source things, we incentivize that, more of that will happen. And it's measurable that the more you encourage that, just like, I mean, there's lots of things measurable about education that we can show. We can show that more education leads to better economic outcomes for everyone within that economy. So, this strangulation of education is actually economically not, and it's in fact been criticized by a big ton of economists that um, essentially by, by cutting, there's two ways you, we could really sabotage our economy. One is by decreasing our educational infrastructure, meaning essentially how much the aggregate people in America know, like our know-how here. Uh, which has obviously been happening at, at an accelerating rate with the, with the basically now you have to be fairly wealthy you can't just be middle class and support kids going to college you have to either be really poor and your kids get full financial aid and they might be able to make it or you got to be wealthy enough to just put the whole bill which is becoming you know considerably expensive so there's that and then there's a uh, lack of faith in the rule of law the, can I get a fair shake in the market? Are my contracts going to be enforced fairly? When I make a deal with this guy, is the government going to, going to step in if this guy tries to hose me? Are they going to step in and make help make things right? And can I get that? I can I get access to that court fast? Will I be treated fairly? You know, is it is a, does the little guy have a fair shake against the big guy? Uh, are fra is fraud punished? That's a, that is a very strong factor in your legal infrastructure for your for your economy. So think about that in terms of no Wall Street indictments in the United States, and we have things that would be normally considered to be insider trading going on between members of Congress. That is the kind of thing that can deteriorate the world's perception of your of your legal infrastructure. If you're not, if you're not going, if you're not preventing fraud, if you're allowing rampant cronyism, if you're allowing people to tilt the wheel, and, and that sort of thing. Well, if you're allowing that, then then your people's perception of how valuable it is to uh, to be in the market's going to decrease. I heard that. Uh like today on the news, there was uh, two CEOs that bankrupted their company, and they got fifty or they got twenty million dollars for bankrupting their own, their company. Well, that's because the, the court said that like it's customary to do that. Well, that's how uh, the Bain style predatory capitalism works. And I'll say no more on the uh, Mint the Ripper story, much like Colbert, but. Uh, Anyway, oh, yes. so, <laughs> it is pretty funny. That was very entertaining. So, okay. So, essentially, you can actually see this in one of the seasons of The Sopranos. <laughs> they call it a bust-out. What they do is they buy up this troubled company, and they streamline it by cutting a lot of jobs, freeing up a lot of 
a lot of capital and then borrowing a bunch. But they make the what they do is they make the company borrow to buy back the shares from their investment company. So they basically bloat the company up with debt to pay themselves. <laughs> And then they just like set the blood balloon float and let it sink to the ground. And then it you know crashes and burns because they've overburdened it with debt. It's totally legal, you know, there's there's specific regulations and what they do is they take it right up to the wall of the regulation. And that's an example of uh, of how the what they call the vulture capitalism works. What you do, you go it you go in, you can make a company more efficient by putting it in free fall flies very fast <laughs> and you can direct it to make it look very productive like all of a sudden your labor costs are way down but you're still getting those orders that those guys made last month you know or last you know you still have residual productivity as you deplete your stores or whatever or as you as you finish up those contracts but now you've cut your sales staff in half and so you're getting only half as many but you're getting to fulfill all those long-term ones that were placed before you I mean, it's it's unfortunate because we allow compensation to be um, <clears throat> what I consider to be anti-capitalist. Because fundamental to capitalism is that you are supposed to have to suffer for your mistakes in the market, um, and the way executive compensation is de defaults to now, that's not the case. They get they get bonuses when things are fat, and they get golden parachutes when they get jettisoned. And some of those golden parachutes are ridiculous compensation to the point where they might as well go in, do a pump and dump on their own company. They'll get the big bonuses for two years. And then when the company starts to crash, they'll get fired. They get that payout. They go to another company. So it is very... Uh, um, and there's also an article on the internet if you want to look it up, anybody out there in TV land, um, about how sociopaths have risen, risen to the top of these finance companies due to the lack of regulations and the style of personality that the, the strong driver personality who just does not have empathy for other people and who can make decisions that are mechanically very correct and not care about anyone else or the impact on any people at all, that type of person can thrive well in an environment where people are not accustomed to being in the same position for long, what they, if you notice these guys shuffle from company to company and then into government and to another company, a lot of these executives and these things, in a, firm, in a firm where you have to work for for 30 years, uh, what is known as a social sociopath, it's somebody who's very good socially, but over time, you'll see it, it'll flip, it'll flip, their image will flicker a little bit, so they're not good for like longer than a couple of years, because they'll start doing... And, these, and, and part of it is this reckless behavior for personal gain and especially for personal aggrandizement, like to be the one who, you know, who did this big score or, or did this thing. There's a lot of... Very, and, it, and if you think about it, it's not really about, about at least what their money's getting them because, I mean, at that point, if you have a billion dollars, if people really had an idea of what a billion dollars would get you, I mean, it would just be beyond... Beyond where most of us would be like, all right, I don't even need, like, I don't need all this. Like, I could, I could do with quite a bit less and, and be just happy and give the rest. Or, like, you know, put the rest into motion in charity. I think most rational people who've had our life experiences would agree with that. But we're also um, seeing a bit of, I know we're, now we're getting into, like, Occupy. I, I was asked to do a bunch of wealth inequality uh, quotes this morning and so I was looking up a bunch for Sean Thompson I think he wants to do a little thing with a bunch of quotes that are Occupy related quotes and I was just on this wealth inequality bandwagon this morning and just like doing all of them from presidents to Greek philosophers to English essayists every, to Adam Smith everybody had something to say about wealth inequality so so yeah he was now I remember he was British? yeah yeah British. okay so Okay, now, economics is an empirical science. That means we take data and we try to make predictions and we are, you know, it is falsifiable. Now, I do want to mention, because I know there's a lot of people who are fans of, or uh, they subscribe to Austrian-style economics. Now, Austrian-style economics does not believe in empirical methods. That is one of the things. They, they're doing this, I believe, a form of induction that is... Um, well, 
I'll say that just look it up. And if, if we want to have a discussion about that, I promise one of my friends I would read the thousand page human action book by Ludwig von Mises at some point. But like not not this semester, please. Uh, Ludwig von Mises, he's the uh, he's he's like kind of the founder of the Austrian school. They don't take uh, data. Yeah, exactly. They don't use empirical evidence. They they say like it's kind of <laughs> it's, cloudy it's, today, so. it's you know what to explain it would detract from my train of thought so okay, thoroughly okay. because it is it is it is something that will that you go huh but but what about this and I go well no but this is what they maintain about that and then you go but no that doesn't make and you're serious well at least that's what I did so I was like okay but generally speaking when anything when I'm dealing with something that uses empirical evidence and I'm comparing it to something that doesn't, I take the one that does. Because, well, I think science in general, and a lot of sciences in particular, have proven that that works quite well for us. So... Yeah, as an engineer. Well, yeah, I mean, math does not lie. And, and if you measure things correctly, and a lot, sometimes there's that, and you're looking at data in an unbiased way, you can eventually figure out the relationships of things if there is indeed a relationship. Uh, now, oh, we're looking at. Uh, nor did it? Did anybody uh, remember what normative economics are? Or descriptive economics? Those are the two different kinds. Normative and descriptive. Descriptive is basically stuff we can show with math, and normative is we want to achieve this effect. So. What do we want to do? So, so like for example, a, a uh, excuse me, a descriptive economic would be something like if the pla if the price of gas ri gasoline rises, people will buy less. And everyone, more or less, if, does everyone here agree that that's true? As as the price of gas goes up, people will incrementally buy less. It's happened. It happened. It's, so, um, but. If we add to that analysis the statement, so therefore we should cap the prices on gas because if we shrink it beyond a certain point, then our economy is going to slow down. We'd rather subsidize gas than have the economy slow down because the net difference is, you know, comes out in our favor. Well, that would be a normative analysis. That's saying, okay, well, I think we should tweak this thing to achieve this effect. The descriptive is just basically what can mechanically happen. And normative is essentially we insert a value judgment or, or some sort of value system in here that we're trying to promote of one way or another. And it just could be we want to improve uh, equality, improve equity. We want to make the floor and ceilings close. That can be done. We want to just not care. That can be done too. Uh, but I think by the time we've gone through a few of these, you will agree, and I think I can even get tea partiers to agree with this, that there are some circumstances under which you must have some sort of intervention outside of the market. And I can make specific examples that we can just, that, that will be obvious no-brainers, I think, to everybody. Um, in fact, no, no, let's make an example. Okay, coal. We buy electricity from coal, correct? Everybody agrees with that? Okay, so... Will we pay a certain amount per kilowatt for that coal, right? Yeah, kilowatt hour. Yeah. Well, up until recently, coal plants were not required uh, by the EPA to regulate mercury emissions. And as it turns out, there's quite a bit of mercury in, in the coal. And, and uranium and cadmium, and there's a lot of nasty stuff. In fact, um, the amount of uranium kicked out by all the coal is more than the amount of nuclear waste that's kicked out by nuclear power. Wow. That's why it's been advocated by people like Dr. Bill Wattenberg, who's a super conservative nuclear guy, uh, that we should have switched from coal to nuclear a long time ago because the waste is about the same, except that you're not kicking out the cadmium and the mercury into all the water waste. And there was recently a study where they studied, I believe, like 220 or so waterways. Um, and they found every fish that they collected had measurable amounts of mercury in its system. 
remember that with heavy metals there is no safe dosage of a heavy metal. Heavy metal, any of it is bad. And the more you get, the worse it is. Now there is ways of taking it out, but they're rather dangerous as well. Uh, so, I think we've gone over this before. I want to broken records. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so, we're going to go through and incentives, incentives, incentives. Let's see. Um, this would be so much better if I could get a blackboard for this, for things like... We have a whiteboard over there. We have a whiteboard. We have a whiteboard. You want me to bring it over? Oh, do we? Okay. We have pens. That'd be awesome. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Um, now, is everybody um, is everybody familiar with the word with the description of what production is? Production is essentially the conversion of resources into products that can be used in consumption. So, it's basically making things people can use. And now consumption doesn't necessarily even mean destruction either. Because if you download a video game you haven't destroyed anything, but you're still consuming that product. You're, you're, you are utilizing. I mean, even though we're not exchanging uh, necessarily money, even if you have a freeware product, uh, even if you have a freeware product, you're, you know, you're still consuming that. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of brutal. I don't know. But um, you sat here. Well, we're not quite to where we need to do it just yet, so we'll go ahead and, uh... We can move right there in the shade. Oh, I don't mind. I don't... Yeah. The shade would be good for the, for the board. Yeah. If you have your back... Well, if you have your back board done, and you have the board face away... Oh, you know what? I think that, that actually works. That, that works. Oh, yeah, that won't do... Wow. Okay. Let's. Uh, okay. So now there are there are four. Um, or excuse me. Five, at least in this uh, estimation. And they, these things vary in the way that they're categorized, but these factors of production. One is one is land. Land is obviously a factor of production. You, know, you have to have space to do things. Oh, that's perfect. Thank there you, you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that also includes things like minerals, the fertility of land. Land includes a lot of. I mean, it's like basically natural resources. Essentially, all natural re land is basically all natural resources. That's actually a pretty good shorthand for it. Um, now then, there's labor. That's human resources. That's all the productive uh, contributions made by individuals who do things. Um, then there's physical capital. That's factories and equipment. Um, and that also includes improvements on natural resources, like if you dig an irrigation ditch or if you, um, you know, alter a river a little bit, flush something out. That would be considered in your physical capital because you've made an alteration to the natural resource. Um, and then human capital is different from labor, and this is where we get into what I was talking about, education, is that human capital is like what your labor can do, and in what allocations. So essentially, you know, if we really, if it's like, wow, everybody really wants a computer, like how productive are we at making computers right now? Well, in the United States, not very and we would never, no one would ever invest here to make those for various reasons, which we can Q&A that a little, in a little bit, because I just did a little bit more study on that particular issue. iPhones. So, um, so human capital basically depends on how productive people are. So, a higher educated populace is a more productive populace in general. 
So, and then entrepreneurship is organ is it's it's a specific human resource that organizes all the rest of it into something that produces something useful. So there's the um, and it also, at least in our money system, it involves taking risks and possibility of loss of resources and that sort of thing. Uh, but it also, and because it's entrepreneurship is essentially experimentation, you know, there is a chance of failure of experiment. And so that uses up whatever you were experimenting with. You know, if you're trying to get a chemical reaction and make a really nice pink rose colored, nice smelling thing, and you Every time you try to do that and you mix the wrong stuff, chances are you're not getting all that back. Maybe. But usually usually not any of it back. So um, so there is that. So uh, let me see here. Okay. Goods are now goods are defined as all things from which individuals derive satisfaction or happiness. That's why it's called good. It's good. You know, we're deriving satisfaction and happiness is good, so these are things that are good, so that's why they're good. Really, I mean, like, they're not, you know, that's why we call them good. We're not always imagined. So, so even, like, clean air is a good, right? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, being able to see the sunset from your back porch is a good. If somebody were to build, you know, that or the Darth Vader Center over there, like by the side of your house, and like put your house in eternal darkness, you would feel you would feel like a good had been taken away from you. For sure. um, now, economic goods are a subset of all goods. Now, economic goods are goods that are scarce that we have to make decisions about. So not all goods are necessarily, like if there's, at one point in time, you know, we would say fresh air was not really a good because before industrialization, pretty much that's what you had everywhere. So you didn't really have to worry about, it wasn't really a good. Well, you know, and as we're seeing with the water being sneakily privatized right now before it becomes a very valuable good because it already is a good but most of us don't realize how much one it is until all the all those huge acre feet of water that are now going to farmers suddenly gets pumped into a municipal water thing and they start pinching our regular water and selling it to us for a hundred times what they paid for it they gotta throw all those things in there so people can like People are watching this later. They can pause it and then go on Google and sort of read. Yeah. Hopefully, put in some sort of. I got some rabbit holes. Thing I was doing. Um, oh, and I want to say, go to Project Censored. Project Censored gets really good journalistic reports on stuff that you will go, what? And like, I don't know. I can only read it so much because some of the stuff's really like very <laughs> unsettling and like some of the ecological things. You'll be like. Oh, like this mass extinction of something that we don't know about because it's over by India or something like that that's associated, they think, with small microclimate change from uh, this current shifting or something like that. You go, oh man, it's already kind of... So, okay, so... Uh, so, now... What would be the opposite of good? Bats. That is actually a term. It's not used that much. But like, for example, weed. Weed. Like weeds in your yard. You could, you'd have to pay somebody to take them away, right? So that is a bad example of bads. Really? A bad? But, uh... It's not normally that, that that's not a cur uh, commonly used term, but but it but it is I mean it is an understood term that it would be something that you would pay to be rid of versus something you would pay to get. Um, now services are intangible goods; they're tasks that can be done versus physical things. 
And if you think about it, it gets kind of interesting when you start getting into like the blurring line between goods and services when you start getting into things like a robot. So if you have a robot in your house that does a bunch of stuff, well, it's a good if you bought it, but it's a service if you lease it, right? But it's doing the same stuff no matter what, right? Because you're purchasing a service if you're paying for it to fold your laundry, for example. But you could just buy it if you had, say, 10 times as much money and you could fold your laundry every day for free or for the price of electricity. So, and that is an area that is starting to be explored by, uh, by some pretty big name economists as far as uh, the thing is labor and human capital is decreasing in importance because physical capital can directly substitute for either of those in an increasing number of areas at a huge amount of efficiency. Is everybody familiar with Fox, Foxconn? Foxconn being the uh, place where most of our electronics are made, like iPhones, iPads, Intel products, Xbox, all that. All those components are all Foxconn. It's in Taiwan. They have about 1.2 million employees. Wow. They're going to lose. They're about to lose a million of them. It's the one where everybody's committing suicide. They make, when you get hired there, you have to sign an anti-suicide contract. It says, you, you know, when I work here, I agree the whole time I work here not to kill myself in protest of, like, the long hours and wages. They're not allowed to stretch during their shift. Like, stretching is a penalizable offense. They live in six-person bunk dormitories and they can be called to work at any time they have to buy all their stuff it's literally companies are, they are very much like human pieces of physical capital that's how they're treated in that way and they're extremely productive and that is that is by the way why why we will never have iPads manufactured in America because because they, they, they made an example they had to have a last minute redesign they, like, they had to have a last minute redesign on one of the iPhones and I don't recall what, what one it was they had to have a last minute redesign and so they literally landed there with the new screens and the new molding at like one o'clock in the morning and these guys summoned like 12,000 workers from their slumber and like made them work, th like they gave them tea and a biscuit and like sent them to work for 12 hours with no break and like got them all out the next morning. <laughs> like, but you, you can't do that here because people won't accept being treated that way. And they shouldn't be treated that way anyway because really, if we can do that, we could just like wait a day and do it kind of slow and it would still be fine. Probably do it with half as many people working at a leisurely pace and maybe decide that we're going to factor, you know, that we're going to make these more modular and recyclable or whatever and we're going to relieve that. Uh, if, if anybody was here for my Bertrand Russell where he was saying, you know, we can get away with everybody working four hours a day. In 1932, he was saying that. And if you look at the productivity increases, like... I think they were saying there's one of the companies makes I think four hundred thousand dollars of uh, profit per employee on average. Well, the, it's it's one of the tech companies. What do those employees do? They just they assemble the parts. Yeah, and and what's really bad is they clean, they polish them, and they polish them with this chemical that's like harmful to reproduction. And almost everybody who works in that area are all women between like sixteen and twenty three. Like, and it's like a permanent, like, teratogen or something like that. But don't fool yourself into thinking Apple is some sort of, like, groovy, hippie place. No, no, well, not at all. Oh, no. Oh, no, I just read an article about Steve Jobs, which actually even shocked me, that he had a deal with his lease company for his Mercedes. Because in California, you don't have to register your car for, I think, six months after you buy it. So he would get a new leased car every six months so he never had to have a license plate on his car and he would park in handicapped spots <laughs> like like all like literally and like one of the guys who was like a whistleblower from apple had all these pictures of like a, uh, like this really pimped out mercedes with no license plate parked in a handicapped spot in all these different places on the apple campus i was like dude that's like that's something where even if there wasn't a handicapped person going to be there. You just don't do that. That's not cool. That's just like, you're just showing your like disdain for people. That's not cool. Don't do that, man. But anyway, 
try to keep it a little bit entertaining. Um, so, now, what is, now we're going to get into the cost of things, when you're talking about the cost of something. Now, what the cost is, there's something called opportunity cost. Does everybody understand what opportunity cost is? Can you explain it? The thing that you give up when you buy something else or do something else. Yes. It's, in fact, the value of the next best alternative. I use that. People use that term all in all different ways. Once they know it, it's a handy thing to think about. It helps you think about, well, I could do this today, but I'd have the opportunity costs when I wouldn't do that. I think of it in other ways beyond money. Well, no, it's, well, no, it's especially, I think it's even more useful when you take money out of the equation because you can, in a network where there's sufficient trust and interdependence and respect, you can do, you can do a lot of, uh, you can really do a great deal of dispensing with that because you have, I mean, you can use social capital as a way where if there's a mutual understanding that everybody's trying to help out, you see it in Amish communities, for example, they're not paying each other to raise barns. It's just when their barn needs to be raised, everybody's expected to put in some work, and everybody does, and, you know, paternalistic as it is, and the women folk go and cook a big old, like, amount of awesome grub for everybody to eat, and it's a very social bonding occasion, which basically, nothing about that. Now, that is something that they have created by, by doing that activity, they created a good, and that good is that feeling of social closeness. They've created a good by virtue of working together, and that good would not have been there if it would have been a guy paying contractors to build his farm, right? So, it's, so there's ways of, that's why one of the things I really wanted to make sure that we got these things down before rejecting economics as a valid science, because we can use these principles of knowledge to look at, you know, if I change my behavior this way, will that cause an increase in incentive for somebody to behave this way? And I think this is actually fundamentally attached to nonviolent communication, because what you're doing is you're increasing by the way you're acting, you're increasing, you're, you're creating an incentive for them to behave a certain way. Because, A, you're, well, first of all, you're removing by basically agreeing ahead of time not to judge and being very non judgmental. You're removing one of the disincentives towards coming clean about something, for example, or, or, or revealing right, something that, that, that might have hurt, might, might be hurtful to reveal or whatever. Right. You're removing a disincentive, so you've changed that dial, and you've also created an incentive saying, well, I'm gonna accept you, and you will probably feel better once you have done this. And, you, and so you have, in, you have informed them of the potential for an incentive that they need to decide whether that's an incentive for themselves. Yeah, yeah. And so, Looking at it, I know it's very mechanical, but if you look at it, it really is how people behave. You, if you give somebody a love biscuit, then they will be happy like they got a food snack. So, well, it's true. I mean, like, people like, I, other than people with specific abnormalities that are generally, I mean, like, physical uh, defect things where you don't have that type of need and it's just because you're not wired for that need, you just don't have it. But everybody has needs that are very, very similar. I mean, there's a big subset of our needs that are that are nearly as nearly to identical as possible. And that's a good. It's also allows you to be able to study people whose culture you're completely, almost completely unfamiliar with, because you you understand those basic needs and the ability to provide incentives that appeal directly to those. Then that enables you to. Kind of. Well, and I think that that's probably why uh, the nonviolent. It's because the nonviolent, the violent, uh, a violent revolution has a lot of disincentives that a nonviolent revolution does uh, not have. Because okay, less chance of getting shot for one, which is a big disincentive. I mean, like, if you think of it, it's like you're like okay, because I mean, I know people who. 
were frightened off from coming down here just because they saw one of the police things, and they're like, they assume that whenever we meet down here that we're like, looking around down the street, like, like getting ready to, to like close the economic book and run. But, you know, and, and there are a certain subset of people that will that feel that way, but, um, so, but I, but I think the non, the nonviolent communication provides a number of powerful incentives because, for one, um, it allows you to co-opt the guys who are tired of being the bad guys in, in their own eyes. Yeah. It allows them to go, okay, at any point in time, I can make a choice to stop doing this, and when those people start peeling off, especially when they've been indoctrinated to be a group thinking. You get enough of them to peel off, it just peels them all off because they, like a very vast majority of them will come because once they've decided, well, man, this is not legitimate, then they're all going to go because they don't want to leave their other guys behind because they've been indoctrinated more or less to be very tight with that. In the same way where, where, you know, any of us, people who we care about, you know, if they're really feeling strongly about something, we'll generally give it at least some credence. Unless the person's, you know, prove it not so reliable when it comes to that. But <laughs> um, okay, okay, so opportunity cost. So in economics, cost is always a foregone opportunity. And that's another. And do, you, do you see how these are? You know, these make logical sense. Like if you if you think about them. Um, they just all. I mean, they are things that are true because it's hard to it's hard to look at it in a different way really because it's, it's so generalized um, so you know we got into the thing of like how valuable is the human life like it, it gets kind of weird there because you can't place anything of infinite value because then you can get into silly things where like you know second wave and everything else dies and all these resources to yeah, save, save this one life. You can make it sufficiently complicated to where you can go, okay, and then you keep edging towards that and eventually you have to break and then at that point, uh, uh, what was it, Churchill that said, uh, the lady said, you know, we just leave you for a million dollars and she said, it was, it's a joke and she said, she said yes, he said, well, we just leave you for a dollar that, you know, they slapped him in the face and said, what, what kind of woman do you think I am? He said, well, we've already established that, madam. Now we're haggling over the price. <laughs> yeah. And so... <laughs> pretty established that. Well, so... So, in other words, you know, there, there's always incentives. There's always opportunity costs. Because no matter what, no matter how many off... Like, let's say we were given just a paralyzing amount of choices. Let's say we had virtual reality. You could experience anything you wanted, which is mind-boggling. There's still an opportunity cost. You can only experience one thing at once, right? I mean, at least as far as we have established in our brains currently. Yeah, you have a finite amount of time. We have a finite amount of time today. I mean, it, even, even, even if you... Even if they... You stopped aging. You still have a finite amount of time in the next hour, in the next minute, in the next day. And as we will discover, humans make decisions on the margins. And that's an interesting thing, which is basically that the margins are the edge of decision. We don't decide what we're going to eat the whole month. We make the decision right then when we're hungry. What am I going to eat right now? And we make that decision right then. And that's how fine our decision making, our, our decision making ca capability is very microscopic. We get in there, I mean, because literally, we, we focus our intense interest on the moment of decision. If you notice, everyone does that. You, you, that's why we think on the margin, and that's why long term plans, that requires certain mindset, and some people have more difficulty with it than others with long term plans, because some of us think, we emphasize the immediate more when we're thinking on the margins because getting that incremental benefit, that takes a strong structural framework of reward in your own mind to keep you going through often unpleasant things to get to the greater reward at the end. But that's also something that can be 
that can be trained. Okay, another definitional thing is technology. It is defined as society's pool of applied knowledge concerning how goods and services can be produced by managers, workers, engineers, scientists, artisans, using land, physical, human capital, and entrepreneurship. So, technology would be like a recipe. It's a recipe of stuff to make good. It's a recipe of a combination. If we have, you know, uh, if anybody here has played Settlers of Japan, you can fill the bridge with like one sheep and one brick and one stone or one brick and one wood. Like you, it's like so. So the recipe for building that bridge is that stuff, and we and we have ever evolving recipes for building our own bridges, for example. You have the recipe for building a suspension bridge, and maybe we improve on that and make it a slightly different recipe. But each one of those recipes is a technology. It is the know-how of combining those things and getting that result. So. And it's like becomes more efficient. Now, uh, do we have a pen? Oh, we do. Okay. Awesome. So we're going to do something called. Um, a production possibilities curve because this is kind of interesting. This is how we show uh, opportunity cost, and we're going to do we're going to do two different kinds. Um, let's say you have a limited amount of ability to comprehend your studies because you are overloaded, <laughs> and you got two classes that are that are not in your major <laughs> because you've let you've double loaded on your uh, on your non-major classes and you got to graduate this semester and <laughs> the school's giving you a whole bunch of sh oh you know, no I, 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 demand, <laughs> I demand a 4.0 if I saw the I would go oh, very oh I'm talking about being yeah. overloaded with classes yeah okay so Move your head, Sean. I can't. I can't I keep moving my head. Oh. Keep blocking your son. So we're going to be looking at expected grades. Who wants to pick classes? What are the two classes that were that Basket are off? Basket weaving. What's that? Basket weaving. Yeah. You have to you have to take it as a general we'll pick general. That's a dumb class for a lot of people. Okay. Unfortunately. Uh, uh, you know what's sad? It was a really, it was a major dump class for me when I was when I went before. I didn't like it. I had lame professors. They weren't bringing it to life. It was all about memorizing the bullcrap tapes. Uh, yeah, I hate it. Like so nothing like Mark Bradley, like bringing out the people. Okay, let's say history and um, just people totally play here. Philosophy. You have to take a philosophy class. Oh yeah, yeah. philosophy. And the worst subject, right? Hey. And what's funny is like <laughs> I, 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 I Oh well you know what? I got I got punked on on uh I got punked on 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 messing now with, that uh, I agree. with philosophy. So You got bummed on philosophy? Oh no 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 I got I got uh I got I got taught some interesting things. I mean I yeah, that's why I made it in. No, I'm so I'm saying that like the GRE scores of philosophy majors oh. are so much higher than yeah. English majors. Than yeah, the and LSAT majors. scores are obscenely in, in higher too, yeah. Oh shit, English, man, you can put that on GRE. Especially, it's so hard. So, it's, a, it, it's, the, it's the SAT for grad school. Well, it's, it's, it's for being a, yeah. Oh, so it's, it's so for in thing. philosophy students, you've got a higher... Philosophy GRE. students, just correlationally, just philosophy students tend to have undergrad philosophy majors tend to have higher GRE scores than what he's saying. He's picking right, up English, English majors GRE to compare scores? them to Way English majors. Wow, really? Group. No, no, I mean, no, they're the highest by a lot. But they're also the highest amongst all the groups. <laughs> like, philosophy majors get higher GRE scores than any other major. And, like, else has No, that's not too. math, that's so, just English. Uh, oh, the GRE is so just English. So, saying what about it? Uh, I mean, I mean, it, I mean. First of all, it's all correlational research, so you don't want to talk about any sort of cause and effect stuff. But the the many people draw an inference from that 
co- that correlational relationship that it teaches you something about uh, critical thinking and logic that will that really and it's that tool that gets you through all these stupid tests they put in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you know that, you can figure out their game and you can get out. So of there's it. a practical use for philosophy. Right. That's the that's the that's the that's, that's the how you measure the taken out of that okay. correlational relationship. But it is also so not just far a behind with these psychology students. So. Um, I would say it's I'm hoping a pretty strong <laughs> I mean, it, it is. I mean, the, I mean, I think Sean though pointed out math. Math students probably. Math students probably, so. math students probably would probably go philosophy, math, then maybe psychology, something uh, like that. But anyways, okay. yeah. Uh, but but few something math students are going to law school. <laughs> I'm so I'm you, have you, have to to you have a smaller sample size to analyze some of these tests because those. Mm. Those math students aren't necessarily going for the same programs that the philosophy students are going for. So then, so it's harder to compare these groups. It's oh, a messy plus, business, but you know, your GRE in English is not for an engineering grad school right. is not as bad. It's not as it's not as you're not expected to have crazy high unless you're, right. I mean, if you're not going into like an academia late subject, in which yeah. case you got to have a really high. One. You gotta have a good one. I gotta take my test. Now, here is our limited time that we have overscheduled our our classes, and to see how many hours we're looking at. But do you see how this is an now? This is an example of a direct trade-off. So, like, we could either fail one of them and get an A in the other one. Or we can get a B and a D, or we can get a C and a C. Now, the decision, and here's the interesting thing about normative economics. Normative economics is we want to do this one because we think that's best for ourselves. That would be normative. Now, declarative is, well, things are looking pretty grim here, guys. Like, (laughs) we could pass both of them, which is probably, if we're trying to graduate, what we're going to do. Now, what we could do... Now here's the interesting thing that we could do. Get is, well, what if we? What do you What do you think will happen to this? To this uh, curve? Let's say we had 15 hours available. What would happen? Ah, the whole curve would move up. No, wrong. It moves in 15 hours. It actually moves this way. It will have the effect of coming up. No, it actually, but it is specifically that it moves. Oh, yeah. But that, oh, that'll, become, goes, that'll become important later. But just remember that it's left, right. Don't move them up and down. There's up and down is there's different stuff that's modeled that way. But that, but yeah, in this case you could move it. It's going to move it in both directions because of the way it works. So you see, if we had 15 hours, now we can get a C and a B, you know, or a D and an A instead of an F and an A, you know. And then if we get if we can stretch it out and get 18 hours, maybe we drink a lot of coffee. Well, now, you know, oh, well, goodness, now we can get, you know, something a little more respectable in my house. <laughs> okay, nice so, example. I like it. <laughs> so now that's, but see, now a lot of times in real life, it's a little different, and that's where we need to do it. Oh, you know what? I do. Okay. So now we're going to change this. We're going to make this... I think we'll just make it like... Some sort of... Okay. Cell phones and cameras. Let's say we use fairly similar technology for cell phones and cameras. Due to the ubiquity of cell phone and camera. So, we're going to go... You, when you say cell phone, do you mean cell phone camera? I mean cell phones themselves and so cell phone cameras are two cameras? different items. Oh, or, I mean, I mean, not cell phone cameras, but cameras that are not cell phones. And cell phones that are not cameras? No, no, no. Well, cell phones can be cameras or not, and that's not really relevant. I'm just trying to come up with two different products. One's just cell phones, let's say smartphone. I'm just going to put okay. phones, though, okay? okay? So, we'll just kind of... 
the camera that I have on the phone is like so good that Ooh, it's I don't even need a camera. Yeah, there's someone behind the building. Yeah, right after I took my difference. sweater off. <laughs> I know. That's a big difference. Big difference. So you're catching audio and video right now? Oh, yeah. Did yeah. no. you cut this out? <laughs> um, I've been leaving these pretty pretty uncut. You like it real? No, real. I do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> With the students in the background making comments too. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like if I, if I start cutting, then then there's then okay. then what do I now cut? This is known as a production possibility. Some kind of on the side. Now this is when we're making any two goods. That we're, 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 now, now what we're doing with this, we're taking everything else out of the equation except two goods. Let's say we have a factory. We can either make phones or cameras. We have most of this. It's going to be costed most of the same stuff. Most we're going to do this. But now, do you see how that it doesn't go all the way out like this? It curves in. Why would it curve in? Curve in. You mean curve? See how it curves? No, no. See if this if like we took a tangent test. off that, it would go way out here. No, right. If, if this was triangular like there's that other one. Because there's an asymptote, there's like a limit to it. Uh, well, it's not. Well, the limit is 50. Yeah. But the limit could have been 50. The reason it bows it's out. It's not a direct trade-off. It is, well, it is in this case. It's actually a perfectly direct trade-off, except as you reach the extremes, you reach a point where you're just producing so much of one thing. That you have it's a like, diminishing it's basically... You're going to get to the point where you don't have enough people who do oh. the specific stuff. The people who do the Critical really, mass, like the so. people who do the programming part for the phones only, well, as you start getting to where you're not doing any of that at all, well, then those guys are just sitting there doing nothing. So your productivity will shrink off when you start to specialize too much in one thing. Because... Uh, Huh. So this is how a flexible workplace works now. This is a graphic production. Now, yes. Now, if I put this in here, this is a certain amount of phones, a certain amount of cameras. Can I do this? Yeah. Can I make this many? Yeah. Is that efficient? Not as efficient. No. Where's the Where's the efficient point? On the, line. On the curve. The curve is the all the most efficient combinations. What about here? Can I do that? No. No. So what I need to do is I would need to make this bigger. Like a technology advance could make this bigger, and then I can reach out here. Or let's say that certain camera parts get really expensive, but the corresponding part of the phone is not. Well, then what will happen here? What if it gets more? So this will go down, but this will stay up, so it will start to bow out like this. Should it, would it, the phones go up more? Or if cameras get really cheaper to make, this will go up. So you can sell more. So yeah, well you can get well you get more. Can produce more. Okay. This is not about selling necessarily. Okay. This is actually producing. Okay. So, so if, okay, that's sure. So if you started like trading with like another country and they started buying, then that would push everything out. That would push everything out. See now, trade. Now that's a really interesting part. Let me get to that because like getting into trading with another country gets into some heavy macroeconomic stuff that gets. Yes. Sorry, I need to interject. If there's anyone that'd be willing to um, cut out of this teaching a little bit early to go prepare food with me, I would really appreciate it. That's all. Yeah. Thank you, Kim. Okay, so now this is this is what is known as an efficiency equation. Essentially, we can determine the perfect edge of this curve to be the efficient the, this is efficient we cannot go outside of this this is as far as we can go so that is by definition the most efficient um, so any point inside here is inefficient any, any point outside of here is impossible is that so you have inefficient efficient outside is that true though only if, like all you care about is Yes, the, well, yeah, it get, the equations get incredibly more complicated when you're dealing with like 20 or 30 different things where you're dealing with, you know, it'd be like, okay, well, we're studying how, you know, 
rabbits and and cats get along in the same environment. They reach a certain equilibrium of the more rabbits there are, and then you know you, you just reach this equilibrium. But that doesn't say like if we throw both those groups in a jungle where there's 150 <laughs> other species within 10 feet, you know, right. <laughs> like what will happen then? If that if requires a lot more universe, modeling. Essentially, this, universe, this yeah, this is this is a very this is a very two dimensional universe where we're just kind of traveling and just to understand yeah, conceptually totally. the way this kind of works. Because you can do it with anything. I mean, let's say we could have made it, which would be even better, maybe like fruit smoothies and fruit pies. We only have a certain amount of fruit. Uh, and smoothies use certain other ingredients. And pies use certain make. other ingredients. But if we start getting towards the extremes of each curve, those ingredients are just sitting around not doing anything instead of being used. Because none of them are being used. And then, so, so that's why you get this curve. So like smoothies are quicker to make but pies will make you more money can you put that into that graph what's that oh like yeah fruit smoothies are like cheaper to make and they're quicker and pies are longer and they cost more because you have to run enough yeah so they, that gets you, into so a could whole you different put, could you put that on like one graph like could you put no that on that graph? You'd, be, you'd put several related graphs and if you moved one thing it would move a bunch of other things around the area um, now Here's a really important thing. There's absolute advantage and comparative advantage. Absolute advantage means I can make more of something than you can in an hour, for example. We're just going to say, let's say I, I farm potatoes. And in a season, I can make 10 units of potatoes. You can only make five because I have a better plow than you. And so you have to get out there and dig them and plant it yourself. And I'm already... I'm able to plow twice as much because I have something to help. So that's an absolute advantage. Now a comparative advantage, now let's say you can only make five units of potatoes, but you can raise four units of cows because that doesn't really take a plow and you're pretty good at that. Whereas with me, I can make 10 units of potatoes or five units of cows. Now, I still have an absolute advantage over you in cows because I can make five because I do have some better resources than you. But you're going from five to four. You have what's called a comparative advantage. That means oh, that your engines. opportunity cost of producing a cow in potatoes is less. Get it? No. Yes. That last sentence. Yes. yes. Cool. Explain it. No, no, no. What it, okay, so let's say you're losing less by doing... By trading. Essentially, it, this, is, this, is how, this is how trade trade can be win. A win. Because it's not about who's better. They can be better at everything. But if the ratio of what they're better at versus something else is different than yours, then you have the opportunity for trade. And there's always going to be an imbalance in that in some areas. So there's always room for some amount of trade between people. There's always something that, I mean, even when it comes to just like, let's say, let's say somebody wants to do somebody else's taxes and the other person cleans their house. Like that person hates their taxes so much that they'll clean that person's house for like two months rather than do their own taxes. And that other person is like, man, I would so much rather do taxes than a house and it's only like, it's going to take me two hours, you know. That's how, but that's how these things are work. It's based on comparative advantage. Like maybe, for example, um, good example of comparative advantage. All right, is everybody getting it a little bit? Or like understanding it? How? The only thing that's true, I think I knew this was going to be tripping me up is the first thing you described kind of sounds like comparative advantage. I mean, you use that phrase if you didn't have it predefined in the sense that I have a advantage in potato production compared to you. So that's no, 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 that's, a, that's, that's considered an absolute advantage. It means I know, that, but I'm just that saying that in could. one unit of time, I can produce twice as many potatoes as you. Okay. But what am I, you see where I'm thinking the word compare is, because you're comparing Because what we're comparing is the ratio. The flexibility. So, the flexibility of so in one hour, so what is my... Like, okay, let's say I can make five cows and ten units of potatoes. Okay, what's my opportunity cost per cow? Per cow. 
Every cow I make costs me how many potatoes? Right. Two. So they're marching to two. Okay. The other guy uh, has five potatoes or four cows. What's his opportunity cost per cow in potatoes? I know we're getting four fifths. Four or five. Let's see. So it costs him. No, 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 it's actually not. He does. It costs him one and one quarter potatoes. Oh. Okay. It's not four fifths, it's five fourths, but it's okay. We're all doing math in our head here. <laughs> so, um, well, I don't, cows and potatoes are potatoes. So think about it. One and a quarter. Well, hey, man, one and a quarter potatoes. This guy's like, well, you know, let's just assume these guys, these guys just, you know, they're subsistence farmers. They just, they eat everything. Their families eat everything they produce. Well, those guys could go have a talk with each other, couldn't they? Because they have that gap. In comparative advantage in potatoes, and if and if we flip the ratios and go to four fifths, right, and one half, well, the other guy, is gonna because it's potatoes. a reciprocal yeah. relationship, the other guy has a comparative advantage in the other good. So that is how trade, by default, you know, without fraud, without scams, without doing things can be <laughs> beneficial to both parties and should be beneficial in my normative uh, opinion should always be have to be beneficial to both parties and, and so now our perception of it is that our economic relationships are that way but we also know that through deception you can think that something is advantageous that is not and that's where the objections come in. so um I think we are Okay, so then, the whole point of division of labor would be, and there is a way to calculate this, but I don't think good for a talk versus a classroom activity, is, you know, there's a way to calculate the perfect share between two people who have, who each have comparative advantage over each other. There's a way to go, okay... Where's that line right there? If we split it to where we're each getting, you know, a good fair shake in here, or actually the exact fair shake. Now, in certain situations, the guy might be like, well, I got 20 of you guys to, I have 20 of you guys in that same circumstance to trade with, and I'll trade with whoever gives me the most. And then that's when you get into game theory. Because then, let's say you got 10 people who are trying to compete because they want to be the one to get an extra potatoes. How much would they give them? And it turns out it's really advantageous for the one guy because those guys totally cut each other's throats up to the, you know, the getting the extra bite of potato <laughs> before, before they'll give up. Well, because unless there's a consequence, you're always willing to get something a little better, and then it just goes right up. Well, that's... So once we understand this, we understand that the puppet strings uh, that the 1% use are actually very coarse and easy to understand once you think about these a little bit. You can see where they go, oh, well, we can use media to convince people that this is, that this is incentivized versus we can, uh, you know, we can make this look very, very bad. Oh, bad, bad. We don't want you to think about this. We don't want you to do this and thus influence human behavior. It's funny, we didn't talk about money. We talked about stuff, I guess. We talked about some stuff, but we got, got through it. That was nice, though. Trade, man. It's bad. We didn't talk about good and bad. Okay, so um, how are we on time? We got like 20 minutes, right? Yeah, something like that. Oh, do we? Okay, well, I can... Oh, actually, it's 37, so... Yeah, it's fine, man. I mean, how are people feeling? Are people feeling more like we'd rather do a uh, discussion? And you know, for the last little bit, or do you want me to try to move on? I think we're probably at a good stop. I think we're at a good stop. Because if we, in fact, we we're at the end of a of a section of the chapter that I was reading. In fact, we we're at the end of the actual chapter. Okay, so. yeah. The next one would be a supply and demand, where you get into how you adjust those. And I really hope I can get. I wish I could get the little computer program. I could probably just go buy it for a hundred bucks, pretend I'm taking the class again, and just like show it to everybody. Yeah. But, <laughs> 
I'm not quite that hardcore. So. <laughs> um, what program is on this? It's some online tutor program, but it has little videos that show all the curves and how they move. It's like, oh, and if this guy does this, and he all of a sudden, let's say this dude, he saved up some money and he bought himself like a better plow, and now he can make a few more potatoes. Well, how does that do to comparative advantage? And it's very interesting because really, if you if you if you could have transparency, let's say in trade, like where you know pretty much what amount of effort went into everything. If you were able to quantify that, which would take extensive computer modeling to do, but you could probably make some certain things. And you were to go, let's say we're having a relationship between supply of labor and demand of labor, uh, demand for labor rather. So we have a, a company, and they have to say, well, your productivity is worth this much money to this company. And what would that do to salary negotiations as far as what would you be willing to do? If you know that you make them $100,000 a year, and that let's say there's a quantifiable amount of capital risk, and you know they have certain, there's certain things. But I think you could get into a point where you could have a logical discussion about, okay, if I'm worth $100,000 a year, let's have a discussion about what percentage of that's reasonable for me to take home versus people who aren't doing that. <laughs> you know, when, when you're looking at, for example, I think it's Apple that makes about 400,000 employees, but that might be just American employees. No, it's 43,000 American employees. I saw that today. No, I mean, how much they, how much profit they make oh. for employees. Oh, it's a yeah. year. So. 400,000 a year. It's something, it's something wow. ludicrous huh. and, and yeah. sickening. And, uh, <laughs> and then we also got to an argument, because this is something we're going to learn in supply and demand. This will be a preview. We'll do a little preview. Okay. People say, well... And you'll hear this. This this is uh, this is like dispelling economic ignorance moment here. Is that people will go, well, if we raise the regulations on this company, then they will ra- they will just pass the cost on to us, and they'll just jack. If, if we cost them an extra quarter per gallon of milk, they're just going to raise the price on a gallon of milk by a quarter. Not true. When you understand. What did we say about fuel earlier? When you raise the price of fuel, what happens? Consumption goes down. Consumption goes down. So when you, if you if, and if consumption goes down, then sellers are induced to reduce their prices. So, in other words, what happens is in a true free market, those desires settle out into a very nice, fair equilibrium. And if you had total transparency, that is what would happen. Because if you know, like, hey, man, I'm not cool with this dude making $400,000 off of me. Like, and me not getting any of that, that's not cool, man. Because you know what? People would say, if you were able to, like, take a, you know, you know, oh, well, how much am I worth .com or whatever, and, like, you're finding out, oh, yeah, you clocked in, you know, several million dollars in productivity, you know, during your tenure, and you're like, Man, my 401k sucks. <laughs> <laughs> like what? No, but I mean, you know, you know where you can see an example of this that is different is Winco. A friend of mine works there. He, uh, his employee owned. They get stock options. He's only worked there. I think he's just about to get up to eight years. He was all excited because they changed their their uh, their uh, policy and they started letting you have a But uh, um, he. <laughs> In seven years, he'd accumulated $180,000 in his stock account with the company Wow! in his retirement. Now, he was a manager, but not a whole store manager, like a, like a section manager. Yeah, a department manager. But he got, and he was on management track within a year. Now, they do have a high turnover rate of new employees, it seems like, but, you know, the impression I got from that is that, like, they're, they're very intolerant of slackers, like, if you slack... If you're late, like you get three lates, you're done. Good. Because they, they only want people who are like, and if and if you're and if you're an ass to people, you get disciplined, and you don't. They now they are not unionized, so that does but that does allow them because they're employee owned. It kind of puts them in a different position because the main reason they fire people is because they're people who aren't pulling their weight, and they're like, dude, I'm gonna I'm gonna work here for like 20 or 30 years. I don't want somebody like sitting over here not pulling their weight. Yeah. I understand. So. 
that's an example of like a worker co-op structure, and that's one of the things that we should be, uh, I think, in the future looking at. No good. As, as, as possible models. We just saw a really yeah. <laughs> yesterday of something, some program at Al- Alvarado Bakery. They're co- a co-op um, bakery, and uh, we get all our bread from them. They sell up the co-op, and uh, an assembly person makes like 65000 a year. Assembly line, you know, bread. Very really? And they interview the CEO, and he's like, how many cars do you need? I just need to make what, you know, my employee, you know, and he's all buddies. With this, and he, uh, well, the, so I was amazed. Because you're allowed to fire no, a no, We've been around for like you're, 40 years. You guys are all aware for the reason to that, right? It's productivity increases due to automation. Yeah. I mean, it used to take a lot of labor to make a loaf of bread, and now it takes very, very little. And the problem... Now, the problem with the accumulation of capital goods in the 1%, and believe me, it's heavily accumulated there. We can get into, like, specifics, but, like, capital goods are hugely owned by the 1%. The thing is, they're getting more and more efficient. Yeah. Well, you would think, if we were all well-informed citizens, we'd be like, okay, productivity's up 80% since then. Uh, I have some of that. <laughs> well, no, how about, can I have an 80% Time raise, off. sir, because that's, you know, hey, if you got to pay for capital goods and take risks, okay, that's fine, but, you know, a lot of these companies, they're not taking they're not taking the kind of risks that you would associate with risk. They, I mean, like a bank, what risks are they, are they taking for that return? <laughs> they have unlimited, they can unlimited tap for reserves. What are they producing? And what, now, see, now that gets into... Now here's the interesting thing like that Keynes, uh, John Maynard Keynes said, is that one of the fun, and I, I don't remember the exact quote, so I'm going to be paraphrasing heavily. It might be a little embarrassing on the playback, but uh, he essentially said that in a capitalist system, you know, your wealth is is supposed to be a, basically a measure of your contribution to society. If you increase society's wealth by X amount. You're entitled to a percentage of that good that you, that basically the goods you brought into the world. You're entitled to some good yourself, and that makes total sense. Like if you're doing that, but the problem is, by what do we measure that? Now here's an interesting article I just read regarding that, which is which is that uh, essentially this guy said that the GDP, which we'll have to learn what that is, that's basically a measure gross domestic product, it's the amount of economic activity that is measured, and you know that's we measure that as success, growth in GDP is good so, here's the problem this guy says is basically no, GDP isn't our growth that we want what we want is like growth and happiness and contentment and satisfaction and comfort and the GDP is the cost of achieving that, and thus we want it to shrink. Uh, but we want to start measuring the other thing and grow that. Now that leads us from a resource consumption-based society. Now if we were to incentivize it, see that's where you change human incentives. If we can consciously decide we're going to work for these incentives rather than these, because we realize the, the, the eventual cost of continuing the systems that are in place is obviously pretty catastrophic. Uh, so at that point, we have to start deciding you know, as free people to restructure our own incentives. And the thing is, when, it, when that works, you don't have to force it down the barrel of a gun. You know, like, uh, you know, in a free society, no one has to tell you you're free. Yeah. <laughs> The more you hear freedom, the more you hear, no, the more you hear talk about freedom, watch out, right? How, 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 what's that? What's an example? We'll get it later. Oh, I know. I, I'm a... Uh, so good. What's an example of how we could restructure uh, the system to achieve that? Okay, how about a CEO shouldn't... Uh, how about an example? Well, no, now, restructure... Place. Now, what do we want to restructure? Are we talking about fundamental restructuring? Or are we talking about restructuring by increments in our current constructed let's say, system? Let's say increments, because I already have... <laughs> well, no, I mean I increments towards off, what? Like, like, like some, increments uh, towards what? Like towards what saying, uh, an open reward. source society? Okay, well, no, one... No, no, rewarding... Um, you, you suggested that if we could... Rewarding the change right. Our uh, if we can change have our incentives. Change our incentives. Well, no, no. For, for example, well, no. Well, this is an example. A maker culture is an example yeah. of that. That's what I was going to say. Things like open source, things that you 
lay no claim to, you just give that out. The more people do that, as you're aware in nonviolent communication, it's a more it's contagious. If you have a lot of people doing yeah. that, people just I don't know. The way I look at it, I guess they feel inherently like a big asshole when everybody's continuously not engaging in conflict with them. It's hard to get Keep purchased fighting. for a fight. <laughs> like yeah. you can't really like continue when you're just not being fed back because you know. So you're saying you're using that as a metaphor that if people were uh, well, let's say I mean like we open source stuff and then you were trying to sell everything that you that you produced. Is that what? You're well, saying? no, no, no. I'm I'm saying like let's say let's say we had a co-op where we I mean, we could even make it where there's money or, or work that's required put into it, but everybody gets to use the resource of the co-op, let's say. Let's say some people put in money, some people go in and clean the place out, some people do work around the place, fix the wiring or something like that. They're each putting in something in, of value. And But, let but see, you could have um, that co-op be worth mo- way more to those people, each individually, than their individual contributions. A lot more, which is what this factors of production augmentation is you see these artist co-ops down here i don't know how well they do but theoretically you could start doing things in local currency is another good example which is one of the things i'm going to do a teach-in eventually with the people who've been participating in this teach-in we're interested and i know matt and i've talked about it and i actually will have the money for that on february 1st uh, to be able to, to do a print run if we wanted to. And basically what, what it is is you create a currency based on hours and you decide as a group, and it's a complete, basically you create a transparent central bank that can issue currency and you can give grants, you can, get, you can make no interest loans. If somebody says, well, I would like to get this many, uh, it's based on, I, I, I thought of this when we first started Occupy as an economic stunt to pull on. And it's based on Ithaca hours, and each hour is worth, you're supposed to be worth about 10 bucks. Um, and they have millions in circulation in Ithaca. And then there are anti-counterfeiting measures. You get, to in, in, you get to have local pride. And what we were thinking about doing is doing a model of it. I talked to the guy who founded Ithaca hours. And we were thinking about doing a model of that um, in the local area and making it occupy hours but we would have each currency be specific to that occupy and whoever wanted to participate in that because it's a democratic currency you can either choose to participate in it or not but think about this let's say I'm going to give him an occupy hour and then you give him a back massage and he gives you an o- that occupy hour well like he was yeah, like you've been enriched by an Occupy Hour that somebody else, maybe they... Uh, Built a food cart. Or do something, yeah, or do something, or like rake your yard or something. Well, and it didn't cost them, I mean, it cost them some time, but remember when we talked about what money is, it's just a medium of exchange. It's all, it's, money is all conceptual. Debt is conceptual. The idea that we're in all this debt that our grandchildren will have to pay, it is impossible. And that's where philosopher Bertrand Russell comes in, speaking of philosophy, where he says, you cannot eat a loaf of bread baked tomorrow. See, it's impossible to owe to the future, to, to owe, for, for the future to owe, for us to be in debt, in actual debt. You can be in debt of obligations, but those are conceptual obligations that we, we could choose to ignore that. We're still to talk about debt forgiveness or the Marshall Plan or what happened to World War II where they just wiped a lot of debt out and said, that's it. We ignore it. We're going as if it didn't happen. It's starting up. Something like that. They say, we can't do that anymore because we can't get the cooperation. But that there was a period when we actually did. Just This debt is incomprehensible and unwieldy and it makes no sense. Kind of like the... $535 trillion debt that we're supposed to have, which is 10 times all the debt that of all the world ever you know, conceived of. So we're saying, why don't we just go, that it. Reset. Reset. Because we've done it before, let's do it again. I, you know, I don't know the details on that, but I... I think that's not unreasonable at all. I think that's completely reasonable. Uh, in fact... 
basically, if you think about it, let's let's say we divided up all the resources into one big pool and split them all evenly or whatever. You know, the people who are above that line are going to go down. The people who are below that line would go up. And that's because everybody who thinks they would go down will scramble to not have that happen. And everybody below that line don't have the resources to make it happen, unfortunately. And that's where we are with 99%. 1% also is that all these intertwined obligations, those are mostly not to our benefit. Think about copyright. Copyright's not to our benefit. 95 years, that's not... It's, it, the purpose of copyright is to incentivize innovation in arts and sciences. It's When you give somebody a 95-year lock on any, any given idea, you're, not incen- you're incentivizing sitting on your laurels. You're incentivizing yeah. making one great work and then living on it. Yeah. You're not incentivizing... Like, if, if you had to, uh, to work... To, to make your supper I mean let's say let's say they gave you like I like to advocate the seven year but you know we could even go shorter than that especially with technological advances a, soft, a software advance is not is worth almost nothing two years after it starts yeah, yeah. well the way um, it's been they, suggested it almost sounds like there was a huge gambling casino that opened up they figured out some ways to do it and then bet 500 trillion dollars worth of money and then lost it, and then said, oops, I guess you guys owe us $500 trillion. And we said, what? What casino? What gambling? What What are you talking about? And they said, oh, we did this all behind your back without telling you about it, but now we're telling you. And some people are just saying, this is mad, that's madness. They don't have our informed consent. It's madness, you know. How, well, it's, it's why do all, we buy the It's all conceptual. All? Plus, if you think about it, we don't even have enough money. There's not enough dollar bills printing to pay back all the debt, right? Oh, there never has been. And so, most money's not printed. Most money's electronic. So like a vast majority. I, I, I can probably... I, I'll have to pull up the statistics for next time. Like, there... Oh, and by the way, anybody, any gold bugs in the audience, I'm sorry to tell you, but there's not enough, there's not even close, I think there's like one forty-third of the amount of cash value of the United States alone in gold in the whole world. So it's just not going to, it can't happen that way. It, it won't work. It, like, there's not enough of that resource to... I just, I don't really see any other way out of it. Out of it, well, I mean, you could do... That's not going to take, like, 50 There's distributional schemes. I mean, you're going to have to have a distribution of the factors of production of some sort. Because if you allow if you allow all these things to be privately owned by... If you allow these things to be privately owned by huge... So you yeah, and hugely a- concentrated in ownership. I, I just don't like this whole. Then I'm not sure so uh, you can have it be privately no, owned no, if that if that cool. private ownership it's was spread very far and wide. Like we all had micro manufacturing. We all decided like, hey, he's yeah, gonna have a you know a three D printer in his place, okay. and when we need plastic you stuff to go to his house, go. and this guy's gonna gonna run food. Yeah, this guy, I and we can all just do that locally without without these huge singular entities that can skew the wheel. You know, that can be like like gold, dollars. Well, look at gold. Goldman Sachs is wildly affecting the price of certain commodities right now because they have so much in the way of virtual wealth that was created. But what the wealth has been created by obligations to other entities of like mind and then rated by agencies that they're paying as being worth a certain amount of money. And literally, it is made up value. And it's a matter of can you convince me? What did I say about how much a dollar is worth? It's worth whatever I can get for it. How much is a CDO worth? Whatever they can get somebody to pay him for it. And they have a whole propaganda machine to make you think they're worth something.